All right, we're here. What's up, everybody? Corey Hughes, Bloody History. So, we're going to continue on with uh, this theme of Mexico City. We've been on for over two months now. <clears throat> However, we're going to look at this a little differently, and we are going to pick up on some testimony of a guy who worked at the Jam Wave Station. So, that's what we're going to do today. Hang on one second. Just doing my usual fucking live stream shit in the beginning here. Looks like we're okay. All right. So today we're going to be reading the HSCA testimony of Alfred J. Sarno. Now, Sarno's not a name I'm overly familiar with. This is fairly new to me. This is going to be in regards to uh, his employment at JM Wave and a couple other things. So let us begin. Okay, so obviously there's a page cut off here. It starts on page, it goes from page three to page six. Lovely. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm assuming that they're asking him when he worked for whomever he worked for. So Mr. Sarno then says, I think from December 1961 or January of 1962 to September of 1967, then from June to August of 68 to September of 1969. Now let me go back. Can you give us a brief summary of your positions with the agency prior to that? I don't mean detailed as to what you were doing. I joined the agency in September of 1951. I was assigned to three countries before I hit Florida. All in the Western Hemisphere Division? All in the Western Hemisphere Division. So you had rather long stations in each of those three or four years. Nods in the affirmative. When did you become an American citizen? I was born in Ohio. Have you ever been stationed with Mr. Phillips in Cuba before you came to Miami? Or were you in Cuba before you came to Miami? Yes. <laughs> Uh-oh, here we go. I can sense it already. I can sense it already. You know what I'm sensing. These motherfuckers are going to be lying the whole time. Just like um, Elise Scaletti, that lying fucking cunt. <laughs> it's, it's almost humorous if it wasn't so sad. And... uh so then Mr. Wise says, and that is when Mr. Noel was the chief. Jim Noel was the chief. And you had contact with Mr. Phillips then? Oh, oh, it appears that we have more pages missing. Goes from page 6 to page 10. Lovely. Uh, Mr. Wise, you never heard of any plots nor of any arrested people attempting to shoot a bazooka when he was giving a speech at Havana Stadium? No, sir. Let me get to the period when you went to Florida. So they basically redacted his entire fucking testimony four pages worth from prior to when he went to Florida. So we're not going to find anything about, about this guy. So that tells me we need to pull everything on Mr. Sarno. Um, all right. <clears throat> when you first came here, that was before the station chief, Noel, had moved the whole station to Miami. Noel wasn't there. When I arrived in Florida, Noel was not then. No, sir. He was not the station chief. Who was the station chief? I don't think I should give you his name. I don't know. Uh, you have the rest of all of them, but I can't recall. <laughs> I can state that there were two station chiefs between Noel and Shackley. Three of them, in fact. You see what this guy's doing already? Just like every other fucking CIA person. He goes, you have the rest of all of them, but I can't recall. I can state that there were two station chiefs between Noel and Shackley. Three of them, in fact. So which is it? Two or three, right? This is what you get from every CIA agent who ever gives a fucking interview. Mr. Wise then says, Shackley came in when, 63? 62. When in 62? I think the spring of 62 is when it was, uh, Mr. Wise then says, when was he replaced by Mr. Dimmer? If I'm not mistaken, it was in 64, I think. June or July, I think something like that, of 64. And then Mr. Dimmer was replaced in 66 by uh, Hines. And then Mr. Esterline replaced Mr. Hines, or was there someone between... Mr. Esterline did not replace Mr. Hines. Nobody replaced Hines because they closed up the station. We understand that the station was operating very recently. Well, I'm not saying, you see, the station you spoke to before you spoke of went out of business in June of 60 when Mr. Hines left. That date doesn't make sense, does it? 
I see. Now, what was the relationship between yourself and the station, administratively in terms of reporting, when you first went down there? When I first went down there, I was outside. I believe it was concerning clearances to get me into the station because I had never been working in a station before, so there were special clearances. So at that time, those two months you're speaking of, I attended a course, and I may have been sent out once or twice to interview a Cuban refugee or one of our agents who had left Cuba. And then you set up the AMUTS program, A-M-U-T-S. Did you start that project, or was that started when you came in? It had been started. The nucleus had been formed at that time. Let's pull everything on the AMUTS pro. It's actually A-M-U-T-S, A-M-U-T-S program. Let's pull everything on that. Um, it had been started. The nucleus had been formed at that time. And except where there's a question of an agent undercover who would possibly be exposed to harm or that kind of thing in regard to the mention of other agency people, uh, certainly at the level of Mr. Shackley or other officials, Mr. Dimmer and so forth, that the general procedures have been that people at the agency or retirees have not refused to disclose names. Now, you certainly have your rights. No, sir. I'm not questioning you or anything, except I've been in this business a long time and I've never mentioned anybody's name. Now, if somebody were to tell me, if Seymour Bolton were to tell me that I could tell you all the names of all my supervisors and everything. It's perfectly all right. But I've never mentioned a name, and I feel that I shouldn't mention a name. Well, we may have to take a break and do that, but let me go on. With regard to the Amitz program, the Amitz Cubans were not contract agents of the station, is that correct? No, sir. They were proprietary employees, essentially, of LASER, essentially. And then Sarno says, LASER, L-A-S-E-R, was a group. That proprietary uh, was set up in September of 1968. Prior to that time, there were a bunch of Cubans just living down in Miami. And what was their relationship to the agency through you? They were just a group of Cuban exiles who were being funded to collect information, intelligence information on Cuba. Were they paid agents? They were paid agents. Some of them received a fairly sophisticated training in tradecraft. In some cases, communications intercept operations with regard to a station in Florida and so forth. Is that not correct? Sophisticated equipment, yes, sir. And tradecraft, general tradecraft training? General tradecraft training, yes, sir. Communications training, well, most of them weren't communicators, so they required very little if they did receive training. Mr. Wides says then, uh, would that put them in a little bit more official status of some sort, whatever the category is called, than simply being a paid informant? No, sir. They were just like paid informants, except we provided them funds to operate with. They are no more. They are not contract. We did not have them under contract. But they would still get training. Yes, sir. And the program first operated where? Where do you physically locate? Were you at the University of Miami at the Naval Air Station at the beginning? Have you ever... uh, no, sir. Uh, where were you at first? Are you speaking of our station? Our station was physically at the air station, but these Cubans did not know where the station was. And you just contacted them separately. They had houses that they rented, and they worked out of different houses, and there were many of them, so I can't recall them. Did you have an office facility apart from the station? Myself? Yes. On one occasion, uh, for a very short period, I had an office. Where was the Zenith Corporation? The Zenith Corporation was located on the south campus of Miami. Apart from the station? No, sir. That was a cover? That was the station. And what was the mission and purpose of the Amuts uh, when you first started out, as indicated in the project outline? They were to collect intelligence on Cuba, debrief refugees, and provide bodies for any possible operations required by the station. They were to debrief refugees. Debrief refugees, collect and evaluate and maintain records. Uh, was there a division of the Amitz members into two groups, uh, with only small group involving uh, the debriefing of Cuban refugees? Well, it wasn't too small a group, but if you would speak of the whole organization overall, yes, it was a small group. And at what point did you set up any cover apart from the station as a proprietary or notional company in between the Amitz people and the Miami station? In other words, were the companies prior to the Latin American Social and Economic Research Company that preceded it in time? In the time that I handled them, which is up to the laser, I think there were three. Three covers all told, or perhaps four. I think we had our debriefing, you know, under one cover. Was that from the start? You had separate cover for debriefing? Well, from the start, we didn't have a place for them, and it was, wasn't pulled together as a debriefing unit. When a large flow of refugees started to come in as when we set up the special unit. When was that? Well, they cut off um, 
64, 63. Well, it could have been 62 or late 62 or 63 and before. We used to send our debriefers. They were within the Amitz group. Specialists in debriefing. Area specialist is kind we use. And we would go out to the reception center and check around and see who had come out of the particular area. At Opalaka? At Opalaka. And our debriefers would go out and check around with the people who came in and try to spot somebody who would be interesting to interview, debrief concerning that particular area. And so they usually picked them up in a car and either took them to a restaurant or took them to a motel or something and would debrief them. And then we found that it would be better to get a building for them to be in where we located them all together, where they could prepare their reports and everything. And so that's when you first set up the proprietary for the smaller debriefing component of Amos. Well, I set up the proprietary as the notionary company for small debriefing office, and at the same time, we rented a building, a larger building, and they used to operate in Coral Gables, received some publicity, and we moved them out of Coral Gables to uh, near the airport in a building where the main office was, where this main office was, where these reports from the debriefers or any other information was collected would be processed, typed in finished form, translated and provided to us. About how many people did you have in the Amitz Cubans at the time? Well, that's difficult to say. Uh, 150? Would you say 150? I would say inside, outside, it could be close to 150. Did you have more than a dozen or so working in the component on debriefing? As I recall at one time, as I recall it, we had about 22, 23 people working in debriefing. And apart from those Cubans, you had a staff under you of assistants and secretaries who were agency assigned personnel? Yes. What kind of staff did you have? Well, it started off originally, since we weren't big, I started off with one secretary and it eventually ended up that there were one or two intel assistants. These were agency personnel, agency personnel, and two or three case officers. The case officers handled segments of the Amets, segments of the Amets. Now, the other, speaking very roughly, 150 or so Amets Cubans, you said so there were some 20 involved in the debriefing program intensified. What were the other hundred odd Cubans involved in? Well, we had records personnel. We had, I would say, six or seven who worked only in records and in maintaining of files and general index cards, and that was it. Then we had what we called our report section, which may have had about 15 people, 20 people who wrote reports, checked them out, cross-referenced, and everything else that was involved in that. What kind of reports did they write? What were they writing reports about? Economic, you know, whatever they were learning from against Cuba and had weapons they weren't supposed to have like Alpha 66? Alpha 66, there were many of them. And we usually had one of our outside types either recruit or get next to an individual of the group and he would penetrate the group himself to report to us what they were doing. Do you recall the flights of uh, the Diaz or one of the Diaz brothers over Havana dropping leaflets? Uh, They're probably talking about the Pedro, Pedro Diaz Lanz and his brother who were associates of Frank Sturgis. What date was that? I believe it was quite early, and it was not in connection with the Amets. I know the Diaz brothers. Do you recall hearing of flights with uh, one of them with Frank Sturgis over Havana dropping leaflets? No, sir. It was fairly widely known. Well, I didn't get into Cubans until maybe it was uh, June of 60, but the only leaflets I ever saw fly over Cuba was the day before the invasion. Those were the only ones I saw. When you were in Miami, did you have any contact with Frank Sturgis, Frank Fiorini? No, never, never. To my knowledge, he never worked for us. Not getting back to the bulk of the Amets group, part of the part apart from the reporting on refugees and the efforts to keep tabs, which I guess is a summary of what you are saying on what exile groups might be doing that the government might otherwise not know about. Is it correct that there was surveillance of the Miami community generally with regard to possible Castro agents? Not that I know of. Uh, There was no counterintelligence program in the Amets. We had counterintelligence component in the Amets program. Why don't you describe that? The counterintelligence program consisted of very capable Cubans who knew of the former, uh, the setup of the intelligence agency inside Cuba. So if anybody were to come out, any refugee were to come out and name an individual that was a friend of theirs that we knew or suspected of working for the internal security, which was the DSE or their external service, the DGI, our counterintelligence group or one of the individuals would go out and debrief the fellow and collect names and prepare reports on it. And they maintained files. And that is what it is. They never got under surveillance of any of them because once a report was written, they suspected somebody. They maintain a file of them. And when Cuban refugees would come in, 
they would receive lists of names to check in their files. And if they suspected one, then they would gather all of the information possible on this individual, prepare a report, name their sources, and they would pass it to the station. The station, in turn, would prepare a memorandum and send it to the Bureau. Is it your sworn testimony that you never knew of any of the surveillance efforts to penetrate groups for counterintelligence purposes by Cubans under your supervision? No, sir, no. You're speaking of penetrating groups. Yes, they penetrated groups. Surveillance, I never sent them on a mission to surveil anybody concerning whether they were suspect or whatever. Was there any surveillance of Cubans in Miami uh, conducted by, whether it was in cooperation with the Bureau or not, conducted by any of the Amets Cubans that you were aware of? I cannot recall if there ever was. I don't mean a specific one. I don't recall ever giving them any assignments. I'm not talking about assignments. I'm talking about whether you're aware of their conducting... Uh, as I say, I do not recall them conducting any surveillance on anybody. Any telephone taps? Never any telephone taps. We didn't have telephone tap capability. Any photography? We had a photographer. When was he used? In what circumstances? Well, the biggest majority of his work was to copy certain documents. I mean, photographic surveillance. There may have been. I really can't state which one he was used on if he was ever used for photographic surveillance. Uh, which what he was used on. I mean, if he was used on photographic surveillance, I don't recall ever ordering him out on photographic surveillance. Do you recall if there was ever any photographic surveillance car carried out by any of the Amets? I have no recollection. I do not recall. Were you getting reports of any sort, whether you would characterize it as surveillance or not, on people who had already come and were in Miami as distinct from the interview reports from the refugees first came? Isn't it correct that the Amets personnel were providing you with reports on Cubans who were already in Miami? Yes, sir. Would you describe that program? Certainly. As I said, they penetrated these groups. They would go around and then they would sit and talk. And as you would call it, surveillance, uh, the fact that they penetrated, they would sit at a table and report on the individual and what the individual said and what they were planning. We call it penetration. To me, surveillance is to put two men on the street following somebody from one place to another. Were there ever occasions when the station was suspicious as to whether Cubans in Miami might be Castro agents that you were aware of? Many. Did they ever ask for any assistance in the Amets group in trying to keep tabs on those individuals or to test their suspicions? No, sir. Who would do that? It would be the CI section of the station. You don't recall any situation in which, uh, in which Amets participated? No, sir. Working with the FBI. The FBI would occasionally ask for the services of one of the Amets, but it was mainly not to surveil anybody. It was to provide information to them because their name would come up or, uh, somewhere in a case. What kind of assistance? You mean more than just a chance to interview them? No, just interview. They never used them to run a man on the street or anything like that. No, sir. They tried to get one individual one time and they didn't know that he worked for us and they tried to hire him and he came back and reported it. We had to advise them that he was already working for us. And you had 115 men in all. There were also women, sir, and women. And all they were doing was interviewing refugees and writing reports on exile potential activities against Cuba. I would say that was the biggest majority of their job. So what we're gathering here, just in what we've covered on Mr. Sarno so far, is that he was one of the guys who was in charge of feeling out these Cuban exiles when they got to Miami. And this will connect us, hopefully, to the, obviously, he's part of the JM Wave Station, which was the run by Ted Shackley in 63. David Morales was there in 63. Uh, George Ioannidis was there in 63. Who else? Those are the big names. Those are the big names who were there in 63. We all know they were in Daily Plaza, right? They were all in Daily Plaza. Um, okay, what was the rest of it? They also went out if our station was going to run an operation and they needed X amount of bodies, certain specialized personnel. The Amets would go and locate the personnel. Uh, talk to them, spot them, get their personal history from them, send it in, and the people would be traced out and checked and cleared and eventually introduced to the station case officer who would use them in our operations. Who arranged for the training and the training station at Parrot? P-A-R-R-O-T-T. -T. Was that used? For whom? When the Amets people received training, some various kind of tradecraft, who would arrange that? Yourself? 
December 1961, when I took it over there, were only three cases of Amets who were sent away for special training. Three cases, three individuals. One came here to Washington. The other was going to be located, located, loaned to a station overseas. He came up and received training. The majority of the training given to the Amets was down in Miami, Florida. And what kind was it? Basic tradecraft, uh, reports writing. Did they ever get any training on surveillance? Yes, they received training in surveillance. Why did they get that? Well, that's part of their program training as a group even though there was no use for them in the surveillance process. I do not recall, sir, ever sending them out on surveillance. Who conducted the training? Our training branch, personnel from our uh, training branch, from Washington? Yes. You say the majority of the training was in Florida. What period are we talking about throughout the period? Well, it could be spread over. Reports writing, for instance, when the agency or the station was being cut back in personnel, this group used to produce tons of reports. And when our station was being cut, the staff was being cut, I convinced the station chief to into having the reports officer, for instance, trained to prepare reports, which would require very little editing or preparation once it arrived in the station, which would take a load off of the station. And it was agreed to. You arranged in general for the training or the training office. I never trained, but they worked throughout your administratively. Through you administratively? Yes. So you were familiar with all the training Amit's personnel would have got. I would say all the training that they received during the period I was with them, with the exception of that one year there. And I almost must state that I, uh, there were, did I jump, did it jump a page? Holy shit, does it jump a page? Uh, no, we go from, oh yes, it does. We go from 28 to 30. So they removed a lot of pages from this. Uh, Mr. Wides then says there were some new people coming in. Yes, some of the people would move. Uh, they got a job that paid them more, but there were very few that came in after the original. I'd say about 1964, I would say it was well established and uh, very few dropped out or were taken aboard thereafter. They all got what you referred to earlier as basic tradecraft training. No, not all of them. How many? There were very few of them in the original group. I never had them trained in basic tradecraft. The original group, which I took over, which if I'm not mistaken, was about uh, 18 of them. And I understand that prior to the Bay of Pigs, 18 in the Amets or 18 in training? 18 in Amets, all told. I understood that prior to the Bay of Pigs, these Amets had been given basic tradecraft training. I never once sent them out to receive basic tradecraft training. After you came, when you came there, there were 18 Amets. And eventually, we're talking about 150 roughly or so. Yes, sir. And you never knew of any of the people who joined Amets after you took over getting general tradecraft? No, sir. No, sir. And to your knowledge, it was only report writing. Well, they trained them in each one of the sections and I didn't train the debriefers. So if a new man was hired and he was put in a debriefing, he was trained usually by the chief of the debriefing group. He was put in there to work along with other debriefers to catch on to things. Now your testimony with regard to surveillance training, uh, who issued that or how many people? If I'm not mistaken, it was four or five when you first came or shortly thereafter. Yes, it was all at the uh, now, now just one second because I went into surveillance training myself. I don't recall whether this uh, four or five whom we trained in surveillance were trained while I had them or whether they trained before I took them. Now, after that, those four or five, no other Amets people, to your knowledge, received any surveillance training. Is that your testimony? That is true, sir. What about uh, picks and locks? Nobody that you know of received. Not a single one that I know of. Did you know anybody at Amets who had capability of any previous experience at picks and locks, surreptitious entry? No, sir. You were not aware of anyone at Amets having that capability? No, sir. You never discussed it with anyone at the station? Possibly. Well, let me ask the question. The capabilities in the area of surreptitious entry or picking locks and no part of Amets people in all those years? No, sir. Were the group that were located in your home states that were involved in the interception of any traffic, radio traffic, or Cuban? Were they under your supervision? They were originally under my supervision, and later the station brought an individual down from headquarters and took over that operation. When was that? Well, the station always had somebody at the station who was reviewing all their work and passing instructions. I handled them for a long time, until roughly, until roughly the arrival of Mr. Dimmer, uh, you have the date there. I think Mr. Dimmer is the one who brought down the fellow from headquarters. And these people received some training regarding the use of intercept equipment, even if they had some experience as radio oper operators. Isn't that true? Sir, I really don't know. I know that I never brought an instructor down to train them in the use of radio equipment. These individuals had worked in, in this work in Cuba before they came out. In intercept work like this? 
In Intercept work, yes, uh, we had two very brilliant fellows who were uh, the top people in the communications field in Cuba. And most of the radio operators had had up to 20 years experience. Uh, they were elderly people and they had been in radio and they could read and they could send it out very well. So your testimony is that uh, I do not recall them ever having been trained by anybody in any sense on communications in general. Now, communications generally, I cannot say that because several of the Amets were trained and several of them were brought out of Cuba because several of them were in Cuba as radio operators and then they came out. They were in the uh, Miami group, not operating radios. But um, but during your administration of the Amets group as a case officer, uh, you don't recall any training being given in communications? No, sir. Do you recall any cooperation of the Amets people with the FBI and other federal agencies trying to uh, DF and identify suspect suspected illegal wireless operations in Miami Castro agents. No, sir, they never did. Amitz was not involved in this. No, I never heard of any. You must remember that when Dimmer came down and brought the fellow, I never saw the traffic anymore. But during the period that I was looking at the traffic, I was directing that special intercept group as part of the Amitz. I never once gave them an order and never saw any that they did. When was Mr. Shackley the station chief? Did you report to him or someone else? I reported to my branch chief. And what was that branch? FI branch, foreign intelligence. And that was the same procedure throughout the period. Yes, sir. Up till 67? Through 67. Uh, well, let's see now. No, sir. Well, it was uh, because later they made the they made the Amets group. It became a branch and they brought in a very senior officer to be the branch chief. I was considered to be the deputy branch chief. Mr. Dimmer brought in the senior officer. And you don't feel like you can give us his name. There's no reason not to. He's retired now. Bill Caldwell. What contact did you have with a man who called himself redacted? Ah, oh, fuck you. He was chief of the MI group, uh, the Cuban chief. And then we have another redacted, and he and another redacted, and uh, and Mr. Wides then says, and he was your principal contact. Sarno says he was my principal. He was the head. He was uh, the Cuban head of it. Are you familiar with the history of the Amets group that he prepared in the late '60s or worked on in the late '60s? I thought so in '66 or '67. Uh, that is what I meant. That he had worked on the history of the Amets group. Well, no. Are you familiar with the written history of the Amets program? I've never seen it. I had established the policy that every three months he had to write up about the group. So all of that, I understand, was all compiled into the history. So I don't know. As part of the Miami station? As part of the Miami station. So I don't think he was told in 66 or 67, start over, start all over and prepare it. Do you think it was a consolidation? I think it was a consolidation over the years. And this is entitled, uh, what do you know? I suppose it would be the history of the Amets. And you've never seen it. I've never seen it. Do you know if it's at headquarters in the Latin American division? I do not know. When the Cuban operations group was set up, uh, let's go back in 61 when you took over um, was approximately the period when Mr. Harvey was setting up the staff task force W. Is that correct? What contact, if any, did you have with task force W personnel as distinct from the station itself? None whatsoever. Uh, let me go back here for a second, guys. Um, when it says here Mr. Harvey was setting up the staff task force W, you're most likely talking about Bill Harvey. Because Bill Harvey, I believe, was relocated to the JM Wave station where he then ended up rolling all the Castro stuff into ZR Rifle. But again, I don't really believe that. It's just what the documents say. Um, all right. What contact, if any, did you have with the task force W personnel as distinct from the station itself? None whatsoever. They never came down and spoke to you? When I came out of Cuba, when I escaped from Cuba, I was brought up here to headquarters and debriefed. So I imagine that the person that debriefed me, uh, this is in July of 61, I would imagine that the individual was part of the task force. I think uh, that it was still in the division. They had not split the task force until winter of 61 or 2. I see. Well, uh, but after that, when you were in Florida, you had no contact with anyone to your knowledge other than station personnel? Well, I don't know. Occasionally, they would call me to Washington to discuss something. And did you discuss something with uh, people in the task force, the Cuban task force? The Cuban task force. Uh, Mr. Cheevers. I know Mr. Cheevers, yes. 
And did you have any contact with Desmond Fitzgerald when it became the special activity staff and he took it over? I know Desmond Fitzgerald, or I knew him and discussed operations with him. No, I never sat down and discussed an operation. I met him at a party, and that was all. And when you came to Washington, what kind of discussion would you have about the Amitz program? I made so many trips to Washington, I say I was also the case officer. I used to travel and recruit people. I did not, or I do not specifically recall ever being called to Washington to discuss Amitz. But you do recall ever discussing the Amitz program with the Cubans in it while you were in Washington? Well, if I would come up on a trip and some of the people who were sitting on a desk here who were maintaining the records and everything of the Amitz, I suppose, yes, they would come around and discuss perhaps the budget or perhaps get them to report in a different manner. I recall on one occasion discussing the setup of how the Amitz group prepared the debriefing reports that they could remove the names from it instead of filing them inside the report. They put the names on cards so they could be into a computer machine here. In the period when Mr. Shackley and Mr. Dimmer were station chiefs, which would be 63 through 65 or so, did you have any contact with Mr. Sternfeld or Mr. Esterline? Which period is this? 62 to 65 or so. Mr. Esterline, who I believe at the time was Mr. Esterline was, uh, was he in Miami? No, Mr. Esterline was on the staff. He, uh, I don't know whether it was on the staff of the task force or who at that time, but I knew Mr. Esterline first from his visits. I first met Mr. Esterline when he came to Miami in either late 61 or early 62, and I never saw him again until he used to make his trips down, and then I understand he was assigned overseas. Did you discuss the Amos program with him at that period, at any time? Well, yes, he was my station chief at one time. You mean in 68 or 69? That's right, but not prior to that? Well, yes, he came down on a Prior to his coming down and setting up the new station, he came down and discussed with all of us who might remain at our jobs there, but not necessarily uh, in the early period of the 60s. Not in the early era. What about Larry Sternfeld? No, Mr. Sternfeld was never connected with the Cuban thing until early 68. Let me get back to cover companies. Uh, You say you set up one company for the smaller group or one notional that was uh, handling the, uh, the refugees refugees. Can you give us the name of that? I don't recall it, sir. Now, there was a separate company for the principal group. And what was that? Well, you named it off of uh, the Latin American Research Group. I thought you said that it didn't start until 68. No, sir. Laser started in 68. Latin American Social and Economic Research. Is that what that stands for? There was a Latin American research that they had. Latin American Research Company. Yes. What was its cover? They were supposed to be doing researching uh, Latin America since they had a lot of files and you could hear a lot of typewriters clicking all over the place. And uh, what's your best recollection of the name? My best recollection, it is the Latin American Trade and Research Company. Company. Did it have any other names? I think you suggested that there were even more than two proprietaries and more than two notionals. Did you have three or four going at one point? Well, it was at one point. At uh, one point, there were three of them, if you included the Intercept. The Intercept people had another name, uh, but basically they were... There could have been uh, three of them at one time, and basically there were two, yes. One of them was Marine. That's it. I think that a briefing group came under Marine Research or something like that. When you first recall being approached about uh, possible use of Amitz people outside the Miami area in the United States... Use of Amitz people outside the Miami area? In the U.S. Nobody ever approached me on it. Uh, They were outside of Miami. But the thing that happens is the chief of the Miami group, uh, when an Amit would leave, this is Mr. Redact. Okay, so So this guy has mentioned two out of three of the station chiefs who were there, but there's a third station chief that's redacted in this document. I don't know fucking why. We should probably get a list of all the station chiefs of the AM wave station. Or the, yeah, the JM wave station, sorry. Hmm. So that name is redacted, and he says, uh, when one of the Amets would leave for his reasons, they would always maintain contact with Mr. Redacted. How much you want to bet that's Morales? How much you want to fucking bet? When they would move to any area, and they would all they would do is report on Cuban exiles in that area. And with the fact that they were leaving and going to another area be reported by you back through channels to Washington for relay to CIA personnel in the area where they were going. Was this ever done? 
Yes, it was done, yes. And was it not uncommon in the case of Cubans going to the New York area? Does it happen fairly frequently? Well, since it was handled in such a loose way, uh, in that it was between redacted and this individual and we didn't have them on the payroll, you mean you didn't have them on the payroll in the sense fact that someone who had been at Amitz in Florida was going elsewhere and you said that happened. And I asked you, uh, we will come to the operational relationships in a moment, how frequently that happened in regard to people coming to New York. For example, I assume that there were a fair number of Cubans generally in there for one or two members of Amitz who went up to New York during the course of all these years. No, sir. No, sir. Would you say several dozen or a dozen? So far as I recall, there was only one that ever went up there, and he in turn collected two or three of his other friends around him who formed a little nucleus, but there was only one Amit that went. What about other cities? Uh, what other cities do you recall people went to? In the U.S.? Yes. Washington? No, sir. San Juan, Puerto Rico, that's all in the United States. Chicago? No, sir. Any place on the West Coast or Southwest? No. Boston? No, sir. So you only recall persons who had been in Amitz telling, why don't we refer to him as redacted, that they were going to another city as being New York and San Juan. New York and San Juan are the only two I ever recall they ever had any Amitz or ex-Amitz or people that had been in the organization went. Now when they went and they recruited other people, that was redacted suggestion or under his supervision. They usually collected a group uh, around people that they trusted. Was that up to redacted supervision and direction? He directed them to, to do it, yes. I didn't even know the individual. I never met him. It's one individual. Did he speak to you about the fact that he was going to do this, Mr. Redacted? Did he consult it with, uh, with you on it? Well, I believe it came up. I knew the fellow was leaving because he was uh, taken off the roll as being in Miami. And we have discussed his being used while he was in New York case uh, anything ever came up. Did you ever recall discussing it? Well, yeah, so uh, we did discuss it. Obviously, we discussed it because this fellow came up with a big thing when they were going to Bazooka, the UN building. Was this uh, one of the Novo brothers or either of the Novo brothers in Amitz in Florida? I believe this is the name of two people who were arrested at the time. Uh, the Novo brothers, that's a, that's a red herring here, people. Um, I'll have to dig up my notes on that, but... Uh, the Novo brothers were allegedly connected to Frank Sturgis, but then Frank Sturgis said the only brothers he knew were the Diaz Lands brothers. So the Novo brothers is a whole another thing that I don't believe is accurate. Um, no, the Amit that was in New York is one of the that discovered the plot, and we informed the bureau, and the bureau moved on it. You informed the bureau. We informed the bureau that the shelling of the UN, and it was the Amits, uh, this one Amit up there, who got uh, the information. And he relayed uh, that someone in New York are back through Redacted to you. He relayed it to Redacted, and we, uh, he informed us, and we in turn advised our base in New York, who in turn advised the Bureau. Which base is that? Domestic Operations or the Security Office? Domestic Operations. And then there's a discussion off the record, because they're not supposed to fucking have domestic operations, right? The CIA is not supposed to operate in America. But they do. Mr. Wise then says, uh, with regard to the information received from the former Amit in New York about the plot to shoot a bazooka at the UN, was Mr. Shackley the station chief at the time you received that information? I don't recall the date, but the date was between early 62, which it had to have been. And because Shackley left, which I think was in July of 64, and that would have meant he was the chief of station. Well, didn't he just indicate before a while we were... Uh, taking a break that you had recalled that Shackley was the station chief. I don't recall whether he was exactly the station chief or not. Oh, fuck you. I can't place the date uh, with what had happened, so I know I went back to the station and I reported it, and it in turn was reported. Now, if I told it to Shackley, or if I told it to Dimmer, if I told it to the two different branch chiefs that were there at the time, I do not recall. Now, would your report uh, be in the Amitz file? In the history? No, in the file, the project file. If we got that date uh, when that took place, the date when the agency had the information, uh, would your report and report of the branch or station in Florida be in the Amitz project file or would it be in some other file? I don't think that they maintain a chrono on Amitz. It was voluminous. Uh, once they were processed by the agency and put into our communications channel, be it by dispatch or by cable, I don't think they retained all those tons of files. Do you recall who the FI branch chief was at the time? <laughs> no, sir. Nobody's, nobody's fucking guys never remember shit. 
If you give me a date that I know, uh, I believe it was 64. If it was early 64, then Mr. Shackley was there. If it was late 64 when Dimmer came, then there was another branch. So there were two branch chiefs. Now, did you relay this information, did you say, to Washington or directly to New York? Sir, I have never handled communications. Well, I didn't mean you. If I write it up, uh, I give it to my branch chief, and my branch chief in turn sends it out. But to me, it would seem logical, knowing communications, that we would send the cable directly to New York with info to Washington. Were you ever told that communications had been made to New York? You said before, uh, yes, I was told because I think there may have been a cable or something coming down and giving the boys credit for the thing. Do you recall now the name of this one Amitz who went to New York? His name was Enrique. Could you spell that? Uh, Enrique, that's his first name. I don't recall his last name. And then Mr. DeMarco says, uh, Lazarus? Sarno says, no, Lazarus is not a last name. How many people did he have working with him? So I don't recall, but I know there was more than one or two. And would Redacted uh, give you reports that he sent down to Redacted? Yes, sir. And what did the reports talk about? They were on Cuban exiles, groups, uh, collection of money, Alpha 66, and people of that group who were up in New York City. Was it your impression at the time that this group had no contact with any CIA offices in New York? Which group, sir? The group that this fellow Enrique had. He had no contacts with anybody else? With the CIA offices in New York, was it your impression that the only contact that he had with the CIA was all the way back through Miami? I believe that was the case. Yes, sir. You had no understanding? Well, obviously, once this thing came up, we put this fellow in contact with somebody in the base up there who in turn delivered them to the Bureau. And this was the domestic operations base, not the security office. Domestic operations. Now thereafter, did they keep contact with this group? I cannot recall. Did you continue after that incident to get reports through, redacted? I believe so, yes. With no indication whether they were also in touch with the agency? No, sir. You weren't curious, or did you ever inquire? Well, I would believe it to be that they were uh, not in contact with anybody up there, because if the report were to come down, they would probably have indicated in their report that they had uh, passed this information on. No, I mean after that, after they were put in touch with the base. That's what I was speaking of. Uh, many reports there that came thereafter, uh, they would have indicated that it had been passed. And I don't recall ever reading a report from them that he had passed the information on to any contact up there. Do you recall any instance in which the agency asked through you and in turn through Mr. Redacted that uh, particular people in New York be watched or investigated? No, sir. How would they decide what groups or what individuals to penetrate or keep under surveillance? Well, there were the active groups. Uh, this fellow used to come down to Miami and he would talk to Redacted, Redacted, and Redacted. <laughs> would tell him, uh, here's people who are talking about collecting money, uh, about supposed operation, how, about, uh, how much money they're getting for it. Uh, where would he get the information from? From you? Get what? Where would Redacted get that? The MI group knew more about what was going on in Cuban operations in the Miami area than we did, so most of the information we obtained was through them. So how would he get the information about potential targets in New York? Because they had the groups down in Miami penetrated. So in Miami, these groups in Miami would discuss their contacts with the splinter groups sitting up in New York and all the information would come about. You never got any written instructions or oral instructions when you were in Washington or Miami to see if you could arrange for this person to get information on people in New York? Never. Never once. What about picketing in New York by Cuban personnel? There's some reference to that in testimony we've already received. There was one incident of the Mexico, uh, I think it was against Mexico, where they went to an affair or something and they threw out leaflets. What about picketing of an airline company or an airline office? I had heard that took place, but I was not in Miami at the time. But your understanding was that it involved Amit's personnel. This individual was involved in it. And what did you understand had been the origins of the picketing? How would it come about? Well, I don't believe it was started. I know it wasn't started in Amets because one individual cannot start it. But the groups, the Cuban exile groups who were located in New York, decided to picket it because I believe of Mexico's relation with Cuba. At this time, wasn't the agency carrying on a wide variety of operations to try to isolate Cuba economically and commercially? I believe they were, yes. I was never involved in any of those operations. And including air traffic people, airlines going to Cuba. That was one aspect of the effort to isolate Cuba. Well, the airlines uh, going to Cuba, if I can recall at the time, were 
<clears throat> not Mexican Airlines. You didn't have any idea at the time as to uh, what Mexican Airlines do not fly to Cuba. The Cubans always flew their airplanes over. The Mexicans were not flying. So you understood this to be harassment of a Mexican company or a Mexican national company because of Mexico's general relations with Cuba. General relations to Cuba, um, that's what I understood it to be. And you didn't have any information that the agency was aware of beforehand? No, sir, I was never involved in it. I don't recall ever seeing the reports or anything because, as I say, I did an awful lot of traveling when I handled the Amets. When you discuss this with the people at the agency, is this your testimony that you never heard any indication that the agency was involved in that picketing? That is, uh, no one ever suggested. Uh, no one ever suggested that the agency was the one who backed the people who did the picketing. No. Now, was there a time when the Amets personnel, who had not moved outside of Miami area, were ever used or involved in any agency operations, to your knowledge, outside of Miami, went on trips to do little jobs? Amets went out of Miami in order to do little jobs. I don't mean to Cuba. No, they went out of Miami to do little jobs. Like, for instance, a specialist in, say, sugar would, say, come out of Cuba through Spain, and he'd end up in New York, and so an Amet would go from Miami to New York to debrief him. Or we would hear of somebody who knew of a well-known government figure in Cuba who came out, and he goes to Louisiana or goes to Chicago. Well, an Amet would be dispatched over to his house to debrief him. That's the only places I ever sent the Amets or the Amets were ever sent. What about with regard to surveillances or breaking and entering? Never. So he keeps asking about surveillance and breaking and entering. Why? Why is he asking this guy who was stationed at the JM Wave Station in Miami from 62 to 64, why is he asking him about surveillance and breaking and entering? The surveillance questions... I would think have to do with, I got a feeling the surveillance questions have to do with Mexico City, but the breaking and entering, where the fuck in the story is there breaking and entering? Well, you got, you got Jack Helms and, uh, Jack Helms and, um, Jules Rico Kimball who allegedly break into Ferry's place and possibly even Garrison's office at one time. But that can't be what they're... Could it be what they're referring to? I don't know. I really don't know. What about with regard to surveillance or breaking and entering? Never. Uh, Mr. Sturbitz, do you know him? Sturbitz? He was involved in an economic warfare against Castro. Uh, Sturblitz or Sturbitz? Sturbitz. Yeah, I know him. See, he just went for a fucking through, through a whole minute of back and forth and he knew the guy. I mean, this is like anti-interrogation training. Uh, he testified he conducted some inquiries in regard to the question of Amit's involvement in possible illegal activities, breaking and entering, surveillance, and so forth. Were you aware of those investigations? No, sir. Have you ever heard any charges or allegations or suggestions that Amit's personnel were involved in breaking and entering in New York against groups like the Fair Play for Cuba Committee or uh, Vince Ramos Brigade? No, sir. No, sir. And you never heard anything about the use of Amets in regard to any harassing action against those groups? No, sir. Never. Do you know if any members of Amets may have been used in these kinds of activities without your express direction or not as part of its CIA task? No, sir. You never heard anything about it? Never heard. In Florida also? In Florida also. What about with regard to Puerto Rico and Amets going there? Tell us about that. Well, there were several Amets who left Miami and went to Puerto Rico. There's a large Cuban community in Puerto Rico with the attendant Cuban exile groups, and it was the same thing as was going on in New York. They would collect data on what these groups were doing, operations that they were preparing, funds that they were collecting, etc. Did you see those reports as they came in? Yes, they came in and redacted would prepare them and send them into the office. When did they start including reports on Puerto Rican affairs? Never. No discussion in those reports. Never once did they write up about Puerto Rican political affairs. I never once saw a report. Did you ever have any discussions with Redacted or anyone involved in the Puerto Rican Cuban community about Puerto Rican affairs? Never. Was there a station operation at that time from the Caribbean in Puerto Rico? No, sir. During the entire period, 61 till 67. To my knowledge, there wasn't. Uh, there was not a station. Do you want to go ahead? 
uh, Mr. DeMarco then says, just a couple. You mentioned, uh, or was it touched upon earlier, the period of time you were actually in Cuba, 1961. 60 and 61. What requirements were levied upon you when you left Cuba? None. Well, you'd better explain that. I don't understand that answer at all. You just went on vacation? I was transferred from a foreign country to Cuba because they needed me. What foreign country were you transferred from? I don't think I should state that. I insist that you answer. And then Mr. Wide said, let's go off the record. And then he discussed it off the record. And then Mr. DeMarco again says, for the record, I think I should explain to you that we are highly interested in the sort of activities that you were involved in in Cuba in 60 and 61. But our investigation has, to a certain point, been slowed down by the inability to obtain the right kinds of documents. And that being the case, and your insistence here on not answering certain questions will require us to simply have you come back once we've cleared this up with your superiors at the agency. And once they have been more forthcoming with documents that were long ago requested about your activities. I don't want to pursue just suspicious suspicions with you. I'd rather talk to you about specific dates and facts. We're going to pursue this very vigorously. And the reason I'm interested in it is the gambling background. And I would like to know your training in that area, your experience in that area, and the reason why you were down there. Now, if there's anything you want to tell me now, or do you want to come back? Sure, I'll tell you now. I was in a country, and I don't think that I have to name the country because you're interested in Cuba and you are interested in the operations that I had down in Miami, and I don't think you're interested in what I did before I went to Cuba. I tell you that nobody gave me any instructions when I went to Cuba. I knew the chief of station in Cuba. I had known him for many years. He asked me specifically to come over for my abilities or qualifications or experience. I climbed on an airplane and I went to Cuba. I met the chief of station and he told me what he wanted me to do. What's his name? Jim Noel. You met Mr. Noel and he told you what he wanted you to do. What did he tell you? He told me he wanted me to set up and stay behind net, a stay behind net in Cuba because the situation was getting very bad and he would like to set a stay behind net in Cuba. This is with the break in Cuban relations. That's right. The pending break in Cuban relations and the rest of the things. And he wanted uh, to set up a net over there. And that's why he called for me. Okay, so you, uh, I went to Cuba and I did not have a job. I had no cover. I went in as a tourist. A tourist can wear thin, so I a tourist can wear thin. So I had to scrounge around in different ways. Um, we had a brother-in-law who uh, W had a brother-in-law who was a professional gambler. When I was a kid, he died. He taught me a little about gambling. So I used to go to the blackjack tables and I would win money here and there and other places. This is the hotel blackjack tables predominantly. No, they had blackjack, roulette, they had baccarat. I would go in there, I would make myself seen. They would see that I was wearing good clothes and I was winning money at gambling tables and that's it. I'm not tied into any syndicate or anything like that. Uh, I didn't know a single soul. You knew no one? Nobody. And your task then, which you learned on arriving there, was to set up a network. To set up a network of agents in Cuba, yes. So you started meeting people to do that. No, we never met people to do that. Describe to me how you did it. People were spotted by other individuals and they're checked out. And once they're checked out and their clearance is obtained on them, they are delivered to me for me to handle and train and what have you. I see. Were any of those Americans? No, I never spotted any Americans. Uh, there were two Americans over there who were already working and they were given to me to use to handle some of the other ones that were involved. Were they also involved in the same type of cover you were, gambling? No, they were not in the same cover. As I say, it was a cover provided by the agency. It was a cover I just uh, naturally stumbled into since I was going to the different casinos and I was winning money there and I could pass myself off as a tourist gambler. These other two Americans you were talking about, can you name them? Well, I'll give you the name. One I would name because I was not involved with the other one very long. One is Emilio Rodriguez, but he's dead now. Was he an American? Yeah, he died of a heart attack, and the other one was Julian. Julian? Julian, I don't remember the last name, but he only remained for about two months after I arrived. What were these two people doing in Cuba prior to the time they were turned over to you and you met them? Collection of intelligence. For the agency? Yeah, for the agency. They were agents of the agency, as was I, but they were residing in Cuba. At any time while you were in Cuba, for that matter, at any time, did you become aware of any agency relationships with, uh, I'm going to use the term generically, organized crime? Do you understand what I mean by that? Yes, certainly. 
whether or not organized uh, people who you've read about in the paper or would consider to be involved in that kind of business, are you aware of any relations between agency personnel in Cuba or elsewhere? None whatsoever. During the period of that time, you were in the casinos playing blackjack and roulette and so forth. Did you get an opportunity to meet people that were running the casinos? No. There was one big Swede in the Capri that, uh, because it was close to where I was living, I would go in there more often. And as soon as I take off from my house, my apartment, I would head over there and he was always seeing me in and offering me drinks, but he was not a big wheel. He was just one of their employees. Where was this? At the Capri. You said a big Swede. A big Swede, a blonde haired fellow. I don't even know his name. I just called him Swede. Was he American or from Sweden? Yeah, I think he was from America. Were any of the people that you were involved in handling in Cuba, commercial or airline people, any airline people? No, sir. Did any of them have official Cuban government positions? Yes, they did. Some of them did. Those were the ones that we were looking for. Uh, I don't think you have uh, anything more at this time. I'm just a little puzzled by your testimony regarding the Amets activity with regard to the Cuban community. You indicated there was a CI capability, but if I understood it, you said only the penetration was for the purposes of finding out about exile activities being planned against Cuba. What was your, what was your testimony with regard to the use of Amets for members of the Cuban community who might come under suspicion as possibly being intentionally or unintentionally uh, suspect? They were, were they employed or they were not employed in any way regarding checking on this? If you mean to say, did they go around and surveil them? No, in any sense of uh, counterintelligence work, uh, keeping their ears open, and reporting back information that might be of a suspicious nature. Well, to explain it, if any Amit were to walk into a place and see a friend and the friend says, did you see Juan and do you know Juan is here? And the Amit himself knows and the guy is talking, he's talking to Juan, used to work for the international security in Cuba. It's obvious where he's at and try to find him. And then they would go back to the files and dig out all the information and in would come a report. Juan is in the city of Miami and here's the stuff that we have on him. He was a Castro collaborator or he's a member of the security forces over there and everything. So in general, it would be fair to say, and I'm not trying to twist your testimony, I know you referred to the basic purpose of being to keep tabs on what was going on so you would be aware of what Alpha 66 and groups like that were planning. But in general, they were the eyes and ears of the station in the Cuban community and might come up with counterintelligence information as well as the information about the activities. Yes. Yes, sir. And as you understand it on a smaller scale, this is also true with regards to the group in New York. Yes, sir. It was not simply to find out about Alpha 66, but they would also report to the extent that they obtained CI, that is counterintelligence information about the Cubans in New York. Yes, sir. What about with regards to the activities at the UN? Any report uh, regarding UN activities related to Cuba? No, sir. Was there a Cuban mission at the UN at this time? Yes, sir. And this group never relayed any information regarding the Cuban mission or the people they contacted in New York? No, sir. Why wouldn't they have been used for that purpose? Because that's the Bureau's domain. Uh, we never checked up on the Cubans, the diplomats who were in the UN. Nobody was ever in contact with them. They never reported on any Cuban diplomats in the UN or any of the Cubans seeing them or anything. Did you ever hear any stories, whether they were associated with Amets or not, of Cuban exiles being involved in any harassment or surveillance of groups in America friendly toward the Castro regime, such as uh, Vince Ramos Brigade and the Fair Play for Cuba Committee? No, sir. You are not aware of any activity by exiles? I'm not talking about necessarily Amets. Not any, uh, not of the activities. You never heard anything. I never heard anything. You're smiling. I'm telling you, I never heard anything. What about Cubans in the late 60s after the Vietnam War arose, being involved Cuban exiles in any harassment or surveillance of peace groups? What do you know about that? Nothing. Do you know anything about Cubans coming up from Miami to be involved in surveillance or disruption of any peace demonstrations in Washington? No, sir. You never heard of that? I never heard of it. I know no Amets and I never heard of any other Cubans. Is there anything else that you have gotten a clear understanding of our lines of interest? Yes, I have. Would you like to tell us or any information? Uh, I have no information. I ran a group there and we were never involved in anything which I would consider to be illegal. They were working against the government of Cuba. I understand that. And that is where all of their energy went. Who was it that would ask you to have members of Amet's details for missions elsewhere in America? You described one where they would go to another city to debrief somebody. 
I would. How would you get those instructions uh, from the branch chief? No, I wouldn't get the instructions since it was a group uh, and we were collecting economic and political intel. Where would you get the information that there was a uh, target of opportunity or someone to be debriefed in another city? If the Amit were to come up with the information, if the Amit were to come up with the information, he would come in and report it and I would authorize him to go into that city and find him because the information could come in many ways. See, there were known, uh, they were known as the Cuban municipalities and operations in the city of Miami, and everybody that came out from like a province or a state would register in it, and as soon as they got information, the word would get around that Joe Blow came in or something like that, and the word would get back to the Amets, and the Amets would say, well, we should discuss this with a fellow, and that's it. You never got any requests for Amets personnel to be made available for that kind of uh, task from Washington. To debrief an individual? Or to travel in general. Yes, yes, they would come down and say, uh, we would like the person because Washington would hear of an individual and would like for him to go over and debrief. What office? It would come out of the Cuban branch, uh, Cuban operations task. Who would come down? Just a member of the staff? Come down? They usually came in a cable. Uh, it said, you know, we understand such and such a person is living at such and such an address and they worked at such and such a, uh, and sending an AMAT out to debrief. Did you have a particular point of contact or several people who were particular uh, points of contact for you that would tend to be the ones sending you cables? No, I wasn't the station chief. The cables uh, come into the station. The station chief would pass it to me or to the branch chief, and that would be it. Okay. I think that's all the questions we have, and I want to thank you for your patience. It's been a long morning. All right. So we really didn't get a whole lot out of Mr. Sarno other than the fact that he was at JM Wave, and he probably knows a whole lot more about what was going on in 63 than anybody else we've read about thus far. And why is that? Because I'm going to tell you with 100% certainty that David Morales and uh, Ted Shackley and George Ioannidis, who all worked at the JM Wave station, who were heads of the JM Wave station, all of them were in Dealey Plaza on November 22nd, 1963, and he would be aware of their absence from the JM Wave station in Miami at a minimum. At a minimum. So, but um, that's going to do it for me today, guys. I appreciate your tuning in. And uh, we will be back tomorrow uh, with uh, even more. So thanks, everybody.